I like that last slide we saw. Come as you are. Do we know who we are? The question, who am I? Do we know that? I think we talk about that here. Reality is um, what we see and what we can touch and what we can think of and um, that's how we live. I dare to say that we have two realities and we live in two realities. So we live in this world of physical things, matter, bodies, relationships. There's also an unseen world and that's the world of energy. And I like to speak of that world of energy a lot because energy is um, everywhere and it's the um, building stone of who we are. So in our world of matter, it's energy because we are built up from energy and what we don't see is energy as well. We can feel it, but we usually don't. So let's go first to what I do, and that is um, visible in, 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 in my work, my paintings. And um, that's what I mean, I like to start off in a void, because when I start painting, I prepare a canvas, I um, prepare the paint, I prepare the brush, some I've made myself. And before the blank canvas or a wooden panel, I sit and I start meditating. And I try to tune in into that level of energy that's in and around me. I call that the world of no thinking. So I don't think, I, that's hard. We, we all know that our mind is not an easy instrument. It does not always want to stop at, at will. And um, waiting, not thinking, meditating, all of a sudden, there's a painting. Very often it happens in a second, sometimes two. There's a few that are, take longer, but it's still from that space where I'm in. Not the space of my mind, but the space of the, around me, the world in me, and that goes through me. As Ben said, I also do meditation um, in jail. I do, as a volunteer, I do a group there. That is one of the most teaching experiences I've ever had. The fact that I'm here talking about this stuff is what I learned there. I, there I learned to talk about it. I never had an audience. And here there were these guys that were so intensely interested in what we are talking about today. Actually, I did a trial of this talk once so far in jail. We had a great conversation after that. So these people are so close to that situation where their mind makes them crazy. Can you imagine? They're closed into a jail and we are closed into our head, but there it's even more physical for them. So let's do this. I invite you to do a short meditation with me. It won't take more than two minutes. These chairs are pretty good to meditate in. So I invite you to sit back in your chair, put your buttocks against the back, but keep your back straight. And so don't lean. You don't have to, but that's, I suggest that. Don't lean, sit straight with your spine up. You stretch your spine, your neck. That's not easy if somebody asks you something to do like this. But let's try and let's close our eyes. So we have this posture. You feel your spine, you feel your neck, and your, the top of your head sort of stretches upwards to the ceiling. Now, feel your feet on the floor. Feel your buttocks on the chair. 
you may feel the temperature of the room around you. And bring your attention to your breath. So you start to watch your inhalation and your exhalation. Connect to your breath. Our breath feeds us. Our breath connects us to the universe. Try to extend your exhalation. So make it longer. So you take a deep breath and then a long exhalation. And you wait for that moment when that exhalation is finished. And there you stay as long as you can. And when you can have to go back and inhale, you do that again. So you exhale, and you make it long, and you wait. That moment after your exhalation is gone, and you are in that stillness, that's a very tender place. In how I look at it, that's the place where we can connect to the universe. The energy field in and around us that goes through us and that connects us with everything in the cosmos. From this place, we can live and we can call it living in the here and now. The world of no thinking, the world of the here and now. Thank you. As I look at it, and in my words, we pop up from the universe. All these big bangs, all these planets that emerge, including Earth, and indirectly us, just come from nowhere. Emptiness. You know it's a Buddhist doctrine, of course, emptiness. And that's where we come from. And even worse, or worse or better maybe, that's also where we go to. We say, when we die, we're going home. Well, that's also then where we came from, right? We, came, we come from home and we go to home. This is home. This is a picture, though. You cannot feel this. You can only see it. What you can experience is that space that's in you. That's what we just tried to touch, that moment when your mind is still and you do not think and you meditate and you expand. So you expand towards the universe. You, your aura gets larger. So you connect deeper and further. We come from here, we go there, then we live our life in the matter that we are. We forget that. Out of this, we are born. All of a sudden, a physical entity. We get a name. We're being taught a language. We're being taught to think. We're taught to become a person, an ego. Parents do that to us. And we do it to our kids. We don't know much better because we're full in life. Full of it. But that's the life as we see it. So we, the child, this little child, is still in the world of the cosmos. It's still in peace. It's crying and maybe want to have food or whatever, but it's alive, it's in the here and now. And it learns to get out of it, like that. So there is a moment, and we all know these moments, that we wonder who we are. And here it just says, can you remember who you were before you were told who you should be? That's about the same as what I'm trying to say. And you see her sitting in a box. That's the box we create for ourselves, especially our parents create that for us and we fall into it and we live in that box of mindful thinking. I mean, thinking, 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 thinking and doing, doing a lot. We are called human beings, but we are more human doings, I think, I think. <laughs> so th the challenge in, um, in our life is 
to learn or get rid of ego or you should not get rid of ego. We need ego to survive. We need ego to do what we have to do. And we have a lot of responsibilities, especially when we have kids and ourselves, of course, and our relationships, the, the ones we love and the ones we work with. But were it that easy that you could just do this, just have this balloon collapse? No, you don't get out of your ego that easily. Most of us have need, they need a crash, a drama, uh, something very, very bad that happens to you. Here, this is the place where I lost my first ego, I had my first ego loss, I my big ego loss. This is the head office of um, the company that owns 60% of all the Shell Group companies worldwide. It's a Dutch company, it's called the Royal Dutch Petroleum Company. The 60% owner of Shell Oil and all, everywhere Shell in the world. The um, CEO of Shell sits here above that door. That's his room. And there's a few other directors there. The level above, you have um, the lawyers, the consciousness of the Shell Group, maybe. And I worked there. I worked on that third floor. I married in um, 1970, so we came out of the 60s. So we had negotiated an um, open marriage. And what happened here, this was my second job, it was probably after seven years or eight years of working. My wife had an affair with my boss. That was a little bit too open. <laughs> And so we got into a divorce. So open marriage did not work all the way. It had for a while, but not finally. The downside of it was that I really lost the idea of who I am, was them, who I thought I was. My blueprint of my life was gone, totally. I had no idea who I was, no idea who I was. When I walked on the beach, I felt ashamed because I was alone. I had no partner. And I did not know anymore what my life was about. I started thinking, but that didn't work well. At first I got crazy. I crashed totally. Mentally, sort of physically. My train was off the rails and it was over, it looked like at least. So there was no life after this, after the first. And there was a night and a day that I had a catharsis, that, means, that meant for me that I cried my heart out. I was standing on my balcony, my apartment was 17 stories high, and I was there and I had that catharsis. Would I jump, yes or no? Well, I didn't, as you can see. But I looked down. The moment I looked down and I saw the world below me, 17 stories down. All of a sudden I started laughing. All that craziness going on there in that world. All these people like me running around doing stuff. It was to me, it was unreal. It was crazy. It was a fake. It was a theater. I just had to quit. So I quit Shell. I decided to take a sabbatical. And because I wanted to learn to stop my mind, so here I went to. This is Daibus El Suzendo, it's upstate New York. I went there. Getting in that monastery, there was a very rigid schedule. A normal working day was three hours of meditation in the morning, three hours of meditation in the evening. They had, every, four, every other four weeks, there was a week of full-time meditation that meant three hours in the, before breakfast, three hours after before lunch, three hours after lunch till dinner, and three hours after um, dinner. Your body cannot do that, especially not the first time. So my mind was racing, doing, going, doing the, the, the 
the race from the past to the future and back and back and forth and repeating itself all the time and my body couldn't stand it. So there was a moment after the second day that my mind collapsed, totally. The moment my mind collapsed, I was out of pain and I was in peace. Sort of curtains opened and I was in heaven. It was in a beautiful scenery, but the main thing was I had no pain anymore and that was a miracle. The moment after, my mind jumped in and said, hey, now I know what to do. That wasn't true because the pain came back immediately. So from here, I started to relate to um, what my mind does to me. And I learned that my mind was not my best friend at all. I had to learn to use it when I needed it, and I had to learn to stop it when I didn't need it. And that brought me into this, this world, and, and also the, 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 the discipline of meditation to learn to relate to energy, to not think when I don't need it, and to just be, be, be a being and be in the here and now. And that being in the here and now, as I told before, is for me relating to home. We are all the time in home. We are all the time in, still in the universe. And we relate to that energy that is there, where we came from and where we go to. And that is what I forgot. And that's what gives me relaxation and peace, and that's what I need to be in balance with. So we live, we live in two worlds, and the two have are, are related totally. So the larger world is the one of being, which you can achieve in the here and now only. When your mind is working, you cannot be in the here and now. The mind is related to the past and the future, and that's the only thing it can. So thinking, by definition, is past or future. Here and now is an experience, has nothing to do with thinking, because if you think, you're not there. So we have to learn to just be. And this world of matter, this world of thinking, is part of that larger world of energy. So the trick is to live in both realities. We cannot always, we cannot live in both realities at the same time. Maybe the Dalai Lama can. That kind of people that I admire greatly. They, their aura can extend into the corners of the universe. We can't do that, but he took a lifetime to get there. Maybe we can as well, because what I say here, everybody can do. It's, it's all our gift. We are human beings, on top of being human doings. So, this talk is about, for me, the art of living. I want to live in the thinking world and be capable there, and I want to live in that world of energy, that world of being, to kind of balance the two, because there is where relaxation is. That stress is in the world of thinking, not in the world of being, not at all. So in the way I paint, I want to live, and um, well, that takes a meditative effort. And that's like washing your hands. You have to do that all the time, because they get dirty. Meditation, you need to do every day, because otherwise your mind takes over. And this is about giving the mind its right place, and that we become the master of our thinking, and next to it, we become the being that we are. That's it.